Hello, and welcome to the Camden Public Library's Friday Explorations Read Aloud. My name is Joseph Cote, and once again, I'll be your host today. Someone asked me the other day uh, if what I might like to see accomplished in this great big world of ours before my feet end their tread on the planet, so to speak. Of course, the first thing I said that came right out of my mouth was a cure for cancer. Um, and I, I think we all would, many of us would say that almost automatically because we've been saying it for so very long. Um, also, rather predictably, I did not say weekly trips to an exotic grocery store on the moon or on Mars. That all is not my cup of tea. <laughs> um, but then after a, a few carefully thought out minutes, I, I had a more serious thought and I said, time travel. Time travel certainly has been some of that from Doctor Who all the way up to many television shows and films. But like today's writer, I am not a classicist, by training, but I have grown curiouser and curiouser, like Alice in Wonderland, about the world of ancient Greece. As a Shakespeare instructor with the Maine Senior College Network, I love above all to focus an exploration on any one of Shakespeare's eight plays set in ancient Greece. <laughs> Perhaps I was once the third spear carrier from the left in a Greek tragedy at the theater of Dionysus on the south slope of the Acropolis. Today, we travel back to ancient Greece and specifically the years 357 to 323 BC, or as we say today, BCE, and a focus on the first 20 years of the short 34 year life of Alexander the Great. The book is called Fire from Heaven and the author is Mary Renault. And I'm a happy traveler. Let me start with some notes about Mary Renault, just to refresh your memory or to introduce her to you for the first time. She was born in Essex, England in 1905, just after the turn of the century, following her Oxford education, which in 1905 was somewhat rare for women. She worked as a nurse, uh, treating especially Dunkirk evacuees followed in 1945 in the infirmary's brain surgery ward. Her first novel came in 1939, when she was 34, called Purposes of Love. Now her first prize-winning novel, however, came in 1948, a book called Return to Night. And in 1948, until her death in 1983, Renaud and her life partner, Julie Moulard, emigrated to a more tolerant and inviting expatriate community in South Africa. Novelist and historical nonfiction author and friend, they escaped the repressive attitudes toward homosexuality in Britain for the comparatively liberal atmosphere of Durban or Durban, Mary and Julie found themselves able to set up home together in this new land without causing the outrage they had sometimes provoked at home. 1948. Although not a classicist by training, Renault moved from her early focus on intellectual romance novels to the quote, scrupulous recreations of the ancient Greek world. The Charioteer, published in South Africa in 1953 and in the US in 1959, launched her eventual claim to fame in the arena of historical fiction 
specifically in the world of ancient Greece. And following that, one right after another, all great books. 1956, The Last of the Wine about the Peloponnesian War. 1958, The King Must Die, a story about the mythical Theseus, all the way up to his father's death. 1962, The Bull from the Sea, which is the remainder of Theseus's life. 1966, The Mask of Apollo. This is Plato and Dionysus the Younger. Then we go Fire from Heaven. This was 1969. I didn't tell you that year yet. It's today's book. And it is about Alexander the Great from age four to age 20 and the murder of his father and his rise to the throne. But after that came The Persian Boy, which was a very popular book, 1972. Um, this is Alexander the Great after the conquest of Persia. 1978, the praise singer, the poet Simonides. 1981, funeral games, Alexander's successors. The King Must Die and its sequel were adapted into an 11 part BBC Radio 4 serial in 1983. But much more uh, recent than that, The Charioteer, one of my favorite first book I ever read of hers, was also adapted for BBC Radio 4 across 10 episodes in 2013. Now, some of the history presented in her books has been called into question by classicists and criticized as uncritical and romanticized. Nevertheless, Mary Renault's success has been enormous. When John Kennedy was asked who his favorite author was, he replied, Mary Renault. The Mary Renault Society is quoted as noting, 50 years later, she remains the standard by which all other presentations of Alexander the Great are judged. The same society goes on to say, after a long, very productive and enduring body of work, Mary Renault succumbed to lung cancer in a nursing home in Cape Town in December, 1983. And finally, quote, in her 78 years of life, she had brought life to the ancient Grecian world and made the formerly untouchable topic of homosexuality in that world, normal, irrelevant, and more human. So, the story of our author, du jour, Mary Renault. So now let's turn to the book. The book is only 480 pages or so, and yet it is chock full, chock full of happenings in the 16 years that it covers, again from the age of four, uh, with a very precocious young Alexander the Great all the way up to age 20. Uh, when he is, becomes the king of Macedonia, and of course, beyond that, all of Persia, etc. Now, let us refresh our memories uh, with a little bit of ancient history facts. <laughs> It'll help you understand the segments that I'm going to read today. I have mentioned when, uh, and that is we're starting in 357 BCE, that was the birth of Alexander. Now, all of the, Alexander the Great lived to a young age of 34 in the year 323 BC. Today's book, Fire from Heaven, covers the first 20 years of Alexander's life to the murder of his father. Actually, it begins at age four. So uh, we are at really 353 BC. Uh, at age four, as she is exploring 16 years, as I said. Now, where? Where is important? Uh, if you uh, know your geography of Greece, uh, which most people don't, it's a long way away. <laughs> Even though the movement 
of conquering covers a wide swath of Greece and the western shore of Turkey, the action is centered in the birthplace of Alexander, and that is the town of Pella, P-E-L-L-A, Pella, Pella, or Macedonia, in Macedonia. This is about 500 miles north along the Aegean Sea from Athens. And if you've been to Greece, it's also northwest of Thessaloniki, it's a very popular destination. Now, despite its size, who is a very big word in this book, we meet a great number of characters, some directly from the pages of history, and as in all historical fiction, some created by the author to carry the action forward. I was reminded as I was reading the book of my time with War and Peace and knowing that from the very first page, I should start graphing this in a chart, <laughs> those three families. Well, with all the Greek names in this book, I should have done the same. I'm going to introduce you to the key characters and the minor characters, only a handful. Uh, because I could go on for hours about everybody. But I'm going to introduce those to you who are uh, integral in the sections of the book that I'm going to read. We'll hear of others, of course, because there it is uh, the court and there are a lot of courtiers, etc. But let me just give you a few facts about uh, the leading uh, the leading characters. Obviously, the key leading character around which the book revolves is King Philip II of Macedon. This is obviously the father of Alexandria, of Alexander. Uh, he is the 18th king of Macedon or Macedonia. He ruled from 359 to 336. Now, despite being noted as a tyrant throughout the book, history is kinder noting that he restored internal peace to his country and by 339 BC had gained domination over all of Greece by military and diplomatic means, thus laying the foundation for its expansion under his son, Alexander III the Great. Philip was murdered at his daughter's wedding in 336. BC. Let us look at the queen. For every king, there's usually a queen. And we do have a fascinating queen, in this case, Olympias, queen consort of Macedonia. She was married to King Philip for 20 years, which actually is a long time in that part of the world, in that bit of history. Uh, it was a marriage of political alliance by her father, which I'm sure doesn't surprise you. She was actually the fourth wife of Philip. She bore him two children, Alexander, whom she claimed to be the son of Zeus, and another child, a girl named Cleopatra with a K, Cleopatra who was two years, they were two years apart in age. Now, she was determined to flee from Philip's grip when he boldly married yet again to a young noble woman of Macedonia, 15, by the way, he in his 40s by this time. In her ongoing efforts to keep her son Alexander in the line for the throne, Olympias earned a reputation as one of the most bloodthirsty women in the ancient world and often considered and referred to as a witch. The third person in the key characters is, of course, Alexander. Alexander the Great, also known as Alexander the Third, also known as Alexander of Macedonia. He reigned as king from age 20 as I mentioned already. Eventually, he overthrew the Persian Empire, which was a huge empire. He carried Macedonian arms to India 
and laid the foundations for the Hellenistic world of territorial kingdoms. He died in, oddly enough, Babylon in present-day Iraq in 323 BCE at the young age of 34. Most popular theories claim that he either contracted malaria or typhoid fever or that he was poisoned. Now, there are only four minor characters and less information about them for you. So we've got King Philip and the queen consort Olympias and Alexander. We have now Cleopatra, the, not the Cleopatra of Egypt, but Cleopatra with a K. Uh, Cleopatra, two years younger than Alexander, uh, the daughter of Philip and Olympias. Uh, she was unfortunately married out, we'll see this in what I'm going to read, as a political pawn, which happened so, so frequently, to the widowed King Alexandros of Melosia and Lynchestes, brother of Olympias. So this is married to the brother of her mother and the brother-in-law of the king. Let us talk about yet another child of Philip. Uh, it's important just for a quick moment in the book, but I would want you to know about him. Aradeus. Aradeus uh, is a mentally deficient son of King Philip's war bride, Philna. She, of course, before Olympias. Um, and who married in order to consolidate parts of the empire. She is two years, he is two years younger than Alexander. So we have three children, so to speak, uh, in the, this uh, scene, in this scenario. And we want to talk about one very important person who doesn't come up until the end. And this is Pausanias, Pausanias of Orestes. Now, Pausanias is was King Philip's personal bodyguard and was not uncommon in the days of ancient Greece. He was also his former lover, eventually spurned by Philip for the best friend of Pausanias. Murder by a grudge because he is the man who eventually murders King Philip. And finally, there's a very important animal, believe it or not, and that is Philip's horse. Philip's horse, technically called Eucephalus, he nicknamed him Oxhead. Uh, he uh, was gifted the horse at age 12 by his father, and the horse stayed by his side until his death at age 34. And this horse, Oxhead, was considered by some to be the most famous horse in history. There we go. So we've got mommy and daddy. We've got uh, three children, uh, one of them a stepbrother. Uh, and uh, we have obviously a murderer and uh, we have a horse. Now I could tell you about 50 more people, but that's not the plan. <laughs> My final notes before I start reading to you, there are three things I just want to leave as seeds in your mind as we follow this journey. Uh, and that is one, conquer. Conquer is the operative word, not only in ancient Greece, obviously, but when we move on to the Roman Empire or when we move back to the Persian Empire or when we move over to the Ottoman Empire, it was always about conquer by charm, by gifts, by titles, by marital partners, or of course, by battle. Heir apparent, it's two words that are very key in this book. Uh, it is an undercurrent that runs through the entire book. Now it shouldn't be, right? Because Alexander was the son of Philip. He should be next in the line. However, there are constant allusions by Philip and others as to the legitimacy of Alexander. 
as Philip's son or the son of one of Olympia's lovers or the son through witchcraft. So heir apparent, this comes up over and over in the book. And finally, the word you're not going to be surprised to hear, the one word that comes up in Greek tragedy all the time, <laughs> revenge. Revenge, as always in any Greek tragedy, rears its ugly head, not only in battle, but in personal relations, he among them, Philip and Olympias, who seem to absolutely hate one another. Well, there's food for thought for you, a bit more than usual than I uh, give, but uh, I think it was important to sort of place this all in perspective. And what I am going to do, following up on some of the facts that I gave you, is to read through the book several different sections, telling you why they, where this puzzle piece fits. We're going to move all the way from age four to age 20, but I am going to skip around uh, and just give you the highlights, I think, that go through the book, because I know as soon as I return this to the library, you're going to want to get it and read the entire book. <laughs> so let's start on page one. Uh, we are again at age four. So we're starting from the beginning and just two pages just to introduce us to the kind of precociousness uh, that Alexander had from the very beginning and the lack of fear, an absolutely fearsome young boy he was. The child was wakened by the knotting of the snake's coils about his waist. For a moment, he was frightened. It had squeezed his breathing and given him a bad dream. But as soon as he was awake, he knew what it was and pushed his two hands inside the coil. It shifted. The strong band under his back bunched tightly, then grew thin. The head slid up his shoulder along his neck and he felt close to his ear, the flickering tongue. The old fashioned nursery lamp painted with boys bowling hoops and watching cockfights burned low on its stand. The dusk had died in which he had fallen asleep. Only a cold, sharp moonlight struck down through the tall window, patching the yellow marble floor with blue. He pushed down his blanket to see the snake and make sure it was the right one. His mother had told him that the patterned ones with backs like woven border work must always be let alone, but all was well. It was the pale brown one with the gray belly, smooth as polished enamel. When he turned four, nearly a year ago, he had been given a boy's bed five feet long, but the legs were short in case he fell and the snake had not had far to climb. Everyone else in the room was fast asleep. His sister Cleopatra in her cradle beside the Spartan nurse. Nearer, in a better bed of carved pear wood, his own nurse, Hellanike. It must be the middle of the night, but he could still hear the men in hall singing together. The sound was loud and discordant, slurring the ends of the lines. He had learned already to understand the cause. The snake was a secret his alone on the night. Even Lanike, so nearby, had not discerned their secret and silent greetings. She was safely snoring. He had been slapped for likening the sound to a mason's saw. Lanike was not a common nurse, but a lady of the royal kindred, who reminded him twice a day that she would not be doing this for anyone less than his father's son. The snores, the distant singing were sounds of solitude. The only waking presences were himself and the snake and the sentry pacing the passage. The click of his armor buckles just heard as he passed the door. The tile turned on one side, stroking the snake, feeling its polished strength slide through his fingers over his naked skin. It had laid its flat head upon his heart as if to listen. 
It had been cold at first, which had helped to wake him. Now it was taking warmth from him and growing lazy. It was going to sleep and might stay till morning. What would Lanarchy say when she found it? He stifled his laughter lest it should be shaken and go away. He had never known it stray so far from his mother's room. He listened to hear if she had sent her women out in search of it. Its name was Glaucos, but he could only hear two men shouting at each other in hall, then the voice of his father, the loudest, shouting them both down. He pictured her in the white wool robe with yellow borders she wore after the bath, her hair loose on it, the lamp glowing and red through her shielding hand, softly calling Glaucos, or perhaps playing snake music on her tiny bone flute. The women would be looking everywhere, among the stands for the combs and paint pots, inside the bronze-bound clothes chest smelling of cassia. He had been such a search for a lost earring. They would get scared and clumsy, and she would be angry. Hearing the noise from Hall again, he remembered his father did not like Glaucos and would be glad that he was lost. It was then he resolved to bring him back to her himself. Starting with the snake. Another proof of his early taking hold of situations. Again, nearly five we are. The royal stables were built in a broad square of stuccoed brick with stone pilasters. They were half empty. The king was holding maneuvers as he did whenever a new thought about tactics, tactics came to him. Alexander, on his way to watch, had stopped to see a mare which had just foaled. As he had hoped, no one was about to say she was dangerous at such a time. He slipped in with her, coaxed her, and stroked the foal until or while her warm nostrils stirred his hair. Presently, she nudged him to say that was enough, and he let them be. In the trodden yard, with its smells of horses and straw, leather and wax and liniment, three strange horses had just come in. They were being rubbed down by foreign grooms in trousers. They, their local store, their head stalls, which a stable slave was cleaning, were oddly bedizened, glittering with gold plates, topped with red plumes, and with winged bulls worked on the bit pieces. There were fine, tall horses, powerfully built, not overridden. A spare sting was being led through. The household officer on duty remarked to the horse master that the barbarians would have a good way to head of them before the king came back. Brisson's phalanx, said the boy, are always still with their saracens. It takes a long time to learn. He was able so far to lift up one end of these giant spears. Where are those horses from? All the way from Persia. Envoys from the great king to fetch back Artabasos and Menapais. These satraps or kings, after an ill judged revolt, had fled to Macedon for refuge. King Philip had found them useful. The boy had found them interesting. But their guest friends, he said, father won't let the great king have them back to kill them. Tell the men not to wait. No, it's a problem, I understand. They can go home free. If any case, envoys are entertained whatever mes message they carry. It's the proper thing. Father won't be back before noon, I think later, because of the foot companions. They can't do close and open order yet. Shall I fetch Menapis and Artabozos? No, no. The envoys must have an audience first. Let these barbarians see we know how to do things. Atos, stable all those horses by themselves. It's always the foreigners bring sickness in. The boy had a good look at the horses and their harness. 
then stood in thought. Presently, he washed his feet at the conduit, looked at his chiton, went in and put on a clean one. He had listened often when people questioned the satraps about the splendors of Persopolis. The throne room with its gold vine and tree, the stairway up which a cavalcade could ride. As far as he was able without help and at the cost of some pain, he combed his hair. In the Perseus room, one of Xerxes' showcases, where guests of rank were received, a chamberlain was watching two blue tattooed Thracian slaves set small tables with cakes and wine. The envoys had been seated in chairs of honor. On the wall above them, Perseus was rescuing Andromeda from the sea dragon. He was one of the ancestors and was said to have founded Persia too. It seemed that his breed had changed. He was naked except for his winged sandals. The envoys wore the full Median dress, which the exiles during their stay had laid aside. Every inch of these men, but their hands and faces were covered up with clothes. Every inch of the clothes with embroidery. Their round black hats were stitched with spangles, even their beards trimmed into little round curls like snail shells seemed embroidered too. Their fringed tunics had sleeves, their legs were cased in trousers, notorious sign of a barbarian. Three chairs had been placed. Only two bearded men were sitting. The youth with them, an aide, stood behind the senior envoy's chair. He had long silky blue-black hair, a skin of ivory, a face both haughty and delicate, and dark, brilliant eyes. His elders being in talk, he was the first to see the boy standing in the doorway and flashed at him a smile, a charming smile. May you live, he said, walking in. I am Alexander, son of Philip. Both bearded heads came round. After a moment, both men rose and invoked the sun to shine on them. The Chamberlain, retaining his self-command, pronounced their names. Please sit down, refresh yourselves. You must be tired after your journey. He had often heard this stock phrase. He became aware they were waiting for him to sit first. The first time this had happened to him. He clambered onto a chair which had been put ready for the king. His sandal tips did not reach the floor. The chamberlain beckoned a slave to get a footstool. I have come to entertain you because my father is out reviewing the army. We expect him back about noon. It depends on the foot companions, whether they get close and open order right. They may be better today. They've been working very hard on it. <laughs> the envoys chosen for their fluent Greek leaned forward. Both were somewhat unsure. With the broad patois of Macedon, its Doric vowels and blunt consonants, but the child's voice was very clear. Is this your son? He asked. The senior envoy answered demurely that he was the son of a friend and presented him. The youth, with a deep bow, declined again to sit but smiled. For a moment, they lit up at one another. The envoys exchanged delighted glances. It was all charming. The pretty gray-eyed prince, the little kingdom, the provincial naivete. The king drilled the troops himself. It was as if the child had boasted that the king cooked his own dinner. You don't eat your cakes. I will have one too. He took a small bite. He did not want his mouth full. What he knew of etiquette did not stretch to small talk during meals. He came straight to business. Menippus and Artabasos will be glad they're pardoned. They often talk about home. I don't think they'll ever rebel again. You can tell King Ochos. The senior envoy had followed most of this in spite of the uncouth tongue. He smiled with his black mustaches and said he would not fail to do so. 
And what about General Memnon? Is he pardoned too? We thought he might be after his brother Mentor won the war in Egypt. The envoy's eyes blinked a moment. Mentor the Rhodian, he said presently, was a worthy mercenary and no doubt the great king was grateful. He's married to Atabasos' sister. Do you know how many children they have now? 21, all alive. They keep having twins, 11 boys and 10 girls. I only have one sister, but I think that's enough. Both envoys bowed. They were informed of the king's domestic discords. Memnon speaks Macedonian. He told me how he lost his battle. My prince, smiling the elder envoy, you should study war from victors. Alexander looked at him thoughtfully. His father always took trouble to find out where losers had gone wrong. Memnon had cheated a friend of his over a horse deal. He would not have minded telling how he lost his battle, but he smelled patronage. If the youth had asked, it would have been different. Further precociousness, as we get to age 12, and this episode occurs, a few years later, Gyros, a tribal Macedonian from the inland hills, set out along ancient tracks, returning home on leave. He had told his commander formally that his father was dying and had begged for a last sight of him. The officer, who had expected it since the day before, told him not to waste time at home when he had done his business if he wanted to draw his pay. Tribal wars were winked at unless they showed signs of spreading. They were immemorial. To put down blood feud would have taken the army all its time, even had it been itself steeped in tribal loyalties. Dairos's uncle had been killed, the wife raped and left for dead. If Gyros was refused leave, he would desert. Such such thing happened once a month or so. It was his second day out. He was a light cavalryman with his own horse, small and scrubby, but tough. Qualities Gyros shared. A gingery brown man with a broken nose set slightly askew and a short bristly beard dressed mainly in leather and armed to the teeth this being required for the journey as well as for his errand. He had been favoring his horse over grass wherever he could find it to keep its unshod hooves sound for the work ahead. At about noon, it was crossing a rolling heartland between the mountain ribs of Macedon. In a wooded dip, birches and larches swayed in a gentle breeze. It was late summer, but up here the air was fresh. Gyros, who did not want to be killed, but preferred it to the life of disgrace, which followed a failure to take vengeance, looked about him at the world he might shortly have to leave. Meantime, however, there was an oak grove ahead. As it hushed in grateful shade, a stream burbled over pebbles and black oak leaves. He watered and tethered his horse, dipping the bronze cup he carried on his belt. He approved the water's sweetness. From his saddlebag, he took goat cheese and black bread and sat on a rock to eat. Hoofbeats cantered on the track behind him. At a walk, some stranger entered the wood. Gyros reached for his javelins already laid at hand. Good day to you, Gyros. So the latest moment he had not believed his eyes. They were a good 50 miles out from Pella. Alexander, his bread had stuck in his throat. He dislodged and bolted it while the boy dismounted and led his horse to the stream. How did you get here? Is no one with you? You are now. He invoked the God of the stream in proper form, retaining his mount from drinking too much and tethered it to an oak sapling. We can eat together. He unpacked food and came over. 
he wore a man's long hunting knife on a shoulder sling. His clothes were tumbled and dirty. His hair had pine needles in it. Clearly, he had slept out. His tours carried, among other things, two javelins and a bow. Here, take an apple. I thought I should catch up with you about mealtime. Dazedly, Gyros complied. The boy drank from cupped hands and splashed his face. Concerned with his own affairs, for him, moment momentous, Gyros had heard nothing of King Philip's supper party. The thought of this charge on his hand appalled him. By the time he had returned him and set out again, anything might have happened at home. How did you come so far alone? Are you lost? Were you out hunting? I am hunting what you are hunting, said Alexander, biting into his apple. That is why I'm coming with you. Uh, but, but, but uh, what notion? You don't know what I'm about. Of course I do. Everyone in your squadron knows it. I need a war and yours will do very well. It is quite time you know that I got my sword belt. I've come out to take my man. Gyrus gazed transfixed. The boy must have tracked him all this way, keeping out of sight. He was equipped with care and forethought. Also, something had changed his face. His cheeks had sunk and flattened below the cheekbones. His eyes looked deeper under the shelf of his brows. His high-bridged nose stood out more. There was a line across his forehead. It was scarcely a boy's face at all. Nonetheless, he was 12 years old, and Gyrus would have to answer for him. It's not right, he said desperately, what you've done. You know it's not right. I was needed at home, you know that. Now I'll have to leave them in their trouble and take you back. You can't. You've eaten with me. We're guest friends. He was reproving, not alarmed. It's wicked to betray a guest friend. You should have told me the right of it at first then. I can't help it now. Come back, you must and will. You're no more than a child. If harm came to you, the king would have me crucified. The boy got up without haste and strolled to his horse. Garros started up, saw he was not untying it, and sat down again. He won't kill you if I come back. If I die, you'll have plenty of time to run away. I don't suppose he'd kill you anyway. Think about me instead. If you do anything to get me sent home before I'm ready, if you try to ride back or send a message, then I shall kill you. And that you can be sure of. He had turned from the horse with lifted arm. Gyrus looked along a javelin, balanced and poised. The narrow leaf-like blade shone blue with honing. The point looked like a needle. Keep still, Gyrus. Sit just as you are. Don't move. I'm quick, you know. Everyone knows it. I can throw before you can do anything. I don't want you to be my first man. It wouldn't be enough. I should still have to take another in battle. But you will be if you try to stop me now. Gyrus looked at his eyes. He had faced such eyes through helmet slits. He said, now, come now, you don't mean that. No one will even know I did it. I shall just leave your body on the thicket for the wolves and kites. You'll never be buried or given your rights to set you free. His voice grew rhythmic and the shades of the dead will not let you cross the river to join their company, but you will wander alone forever before the wide gates of Hades house. No, don't move. Gyrus said immobile. He gave him time to think. Through ignorant, though ignorant of the supper party, he knew about the king's new wedding and those before. There was already a boy from one of them, Folk said it had started bright enough, but it turned out an idiot, no doubt poisoned by the queen. Maybe she had only bribed the nurse to drop it on its head. Maybe it was just a natural, but there might be others. If young Alexander wanted to make himself a man ahead of his time, one could see why. Well, said the boy, will you pledge yourself? I can't stand like this all day. 
What I've ever done to deserve this of the gods, they only know. What do you want me to swear to? Not to get word to Pella of me, to tell no one my name without my leave, not to keep me from going into battle or get anyone else to do it. You must swear all that and call down a death curse on yourself if you break your oath. Garrus felt himself flinch. He wanted no such compacts with a witch's son. The boy lowered his weapons, but kept the thong in his fingers, twisted for a throw. You'll have to do it. I don't want creeping up to bind me when I'm asleep. I could sit up the watch, but it would be stupid before a battle. So if you want to come out of this wood alive, you'll have to swear. And what is to become of me after? If I live, I'll see you right. You must chance my dying, that's war. He reached into his leather saddlebag, looking over his shoulder at the still unsworn Gyrus, and took out a piece of meat. It smelled high, not having been fresh when it left Pella. This is from a haunch of sacrifice, he said, slapping it down upon a boulder. I knew we should have to do this. Come here, lay your hand on it. Have you respect for oaths before the gods? Yes. His hand was so chilly that the dead goat flesh felt quite warm. Then say this after me. The oath was elaborate and exact. The death fate invoked was ghastly. The boy was well versed in such things and had on his own account a ready awareness of loopholes. Garris finished binding himself as he was told and went to swill his bloody hand in the running stream. The boy sniffed at the meat. I don't think this is fit to eat, even if we were to waste time making fire. He tossed it away, holstered his javelin and came back to Garris's side. Well, that's done. Now we can go on like friends. Let's finish eating while you tell me about the war. Passing his hand across his brow, Gyrus began to recite his kinsman's injuries. No, I know about that. How many are you? Uh, how many are they? What kind of country is it? Have you horses? That track threaded green hills steadily rising. Grass gave way to bracken and thyme. The track wound past pine woods and thickets of arbutus. The ranges heaved up all round them. They met mountain air with its life-giving holy pureness. They entered the open secrecy of the heights. Gyrus traced back the feud three generations. The boy, his first questions once answered, proved a good listener. Of his own affairs, he said only, when I've taken my man, you must be my witness at Pella. The king didn't take his arm till he was 15. I'm 12. <laughs> Amazing sense of stage presence at age 12. Education for our man and his friends uh, started at age 13. So we're now one more further on, age 13 to 17. And let's find out who he studied with. I know now who it will be. Father's had a letter. He sent it for me this morning. I hope this man will be bearable. If not, we must make a plan. You can count on me, said Hephaestion, even if you want to drown him. You'll put me with more than enough. Is he a real philosopher? They were sitting in the trough between two of the palace gables, a private spot since only Alexander had climbed there till he showed Hephaestion the route. Oh, yes, from the academy. He was taught by Plato. You'll come to the lessons. Father says you can. I'm, I'll only hold you back. Sophists teach by disputation. He wants my friends. We can think later who else to have. It won't just be logic chopping. He'll have to teach things I can use. Father told him that. He wrote back that a men's edu man's education should be suited to his station and his duties. That doesn't tell us much. At least these, these one we can beat you. He's an Athenian. No, a Stagrite. He's the son of Nicomachus, who was my grandfather Amantus's doctor. My father's too, I suppose. 
when he was a child. You know how Armandus lived like a wolf in hunting country, throwing out his enemies or trying to get back himself. Nicomachus must have been loyal. I don't know how good a doctor he was. Amantus died in bed. That's very rare in our family. So this son, what's he called? Aristotle. He knows the country. That's something. Is he very old? About 40. Not old for a philosopher. They live forever. Isocrates, who wants father to lead the Greeks, is 90 odd, and he applied for the job. Plato lived to over 80. Father says Aristotle had hoped to be head of the school, but Plato had chosen a nephew of his. That's why Aristotle left Athens. It was some weeks before the philosopher arrived, but his presence came before him. Hephaestion had underrated him. He not only knew the country, but the court, and his knowledge was up to date. He had family guest ties at Pella and many traveled friends. The king, well aware of this, had written, offering to provide, if it seemed of use, a precinct where the prince and his friends could study undisturbed. The philosopher read approvingly between the lines. The boy was to be taken from his mother's claws, in return, the father, too, would let well alone. It was more than he had dared hope. He wrote back promptly, suggesting the prince and his fellow students be lodged at some distance from the court's distractions, and adding, as an afterthought, a recommendation of pure upland air. There were no sizable hills within miles of Pella. On the footslopes of Mount Bermion, west of the Pella Plain, was a good house which had gone downhill in the wars. Philip bought it and put it in order. It was more than 20 miles out. It would do very well. He added a wing and a gymnasium, and since the philosopher had asked for somewhere to walk about, had a garden cleared. Nothing formal. A pretty editing of nature, what the Persians called a paradise. It was said that the legendary pleasance of King Midas had been thereabouts. Everything flourished there. We move on to age 18. A lot of great things have happened in this period. I should have told you that indeed the war that he brought himself into with Gyrus, uh, he did kill his first man at age 12 on foot, it's not, it doesn't count if you're on horseback, on foot. And of course, this sounds gruesome, but it would be what one did in those days. He did bring the head back to Pella to prove that he had done. And therefore, he gained his uh, belt and his own sword at 12, his father at 15. So that was a bit of up one man, up one manship one-upmanship. Let's see, at age 18, uh, we have a birthday party for him by his father. By the calendar of Macedon, it was the month of the lion. King Philip gave a birthday feast in the fort for Alexander. He was 18. Alatia had been made snug, woven hangings on the wall of the royal quarters, tiles on the floor. While the guest was singing, Phil Philip said to his son, You've not named your gift yet. What would you like? Alexander smiled. You know that, Father. You've earned it. It's yours. It won't be long now. I shall take the right wing. That goes back time out of mind. You will command the cavalry. Slowly, Alexander sat down on the table, his golden cup his eyes shimmering and wide with wine and visions, met Philip's lopsided black glint. If you ever regret it, Father, I shan't be there to know. The apartment was cheered and toasted. Once more, the birth omens were remembered. So at age 18, he's leaving the cal cavalry 
of up to 600 men at age 18. Incredible. Let's uh, take a look now. We're going to the fifth marriage of Papa uh, to a 15-year-old girl who is the daughter of a man who Philip definitely wants to align with as he moves west, conquering uh, the uh, entire uh, country of Greece. So he decides to marry the 15 year old, which you can quite imagine how mama at home feels, Olympias married 20 years, she the fourth wife, now the fifth wife. And what is to happen to her? Is she to be put out to pasture while this new girl becomes the queen of Macedon? Attalos was running on about the good old native blood of Macedon. Attalos, I'm sorry, was, is the, daughter, the girl's father. And they've been drinking for a bit at the wedding ceremony. Everybody has been. He had conned his speech well, but lured on by smiling Dionysus, he knew he could now do better. In the person of this fair maiden, the dear homeland took back her king to her breast with the blessing of the ancestral gods. Let us pray to them, he cried in sudden inspiration, for a lawful, true-born heir. There was an outbreak of muddled noise. Applause, protest, dismay, clumsy efforts to smother danger and jollity. The voices changed and checked. Atalos, instead of drinking the toast, had clapped his other hand to his head. Blood showed between his fingers. Something bright, a silver drinking cup was clattering along the mosaic floor. Alexander leaned forward on his supper couch propped upon one hand, he had thrown without getting up. Uproar began echoing in the high hall. His voice, which had carried through the din of Cheronia, called out, you blackguard, are you calling me a bastard? The young men, his friends, yelled out indignant applause. Atalos, perceiving what had hit him, made a choking sound and hurled his heavy goblet at Alexander, who measured its course and did not trouble to move. It fell short halfway. Friends and kinsmen shouted. It began to sound like a battlefield. Philip, furious and knowing now where to vent his anger, roared over the clamor. How dare you, boy, how dare you behave yourself or go home? Alexander hardly raised his voice. Like his cup, it struck where it was aimed. You filthy old goat, will you never have any shame? All Hellas can wind and wind your stink. What will you do in Asia? No wonder the Athenians laugh. For a moment, the only answer was the sound of breathing, like a laboring horses. The red of the king's face deepened to purple. His hand fumbled about the couch. He alone here in the ceremonial dress of the bridegroom had a sword. Son of a whore. He swung off the couch, upsetting his taper-legged supper table. There was a crash of cups and dessert plates. He grasped his sword hilt. Alexander, Alexander, muttered Hephaestion desperately. Come away, quick, come. As if he had not existed, Alexander slid neatly down on the far side of the couch, grasped the wood in both hands, and waited with a cold, eager smile. Panting and limping, drawn sword in hand, Philip stumbled through the mess upon the floor towards the enemy. His foot slipped on a fruit paring. He came down hard on the lame leg, skidded and crashed headlong among sweets and sherds. Ephaestion took a step forward. For a moment, he had been instinct to help him out. 
Alexander came around the supper couch, hands on belt, head tilted. He looked down at the red stertorous cursing man sprawling in spilled wine and reaching about for a sword. Look, man, look who is getting ready to cross from Europe into Asia. And he falls flat, crossing from couch to couch. Well, you can see, obviously, two things there. One is the reference to a true born heir. Uh, Olympias was not from Macedon. So later it uh, references made to what he really meant was a wife from Macedon, meaning a true, a true born heir. But of course, that's not the way Alexander takes it. But you can certainly see of what is happening in the relationship between the two. The next episode that causes a, a great deal of uh, anger as we get close to uh, a climax here uh, is the son I mentioned earlier of the mentally deficient son from a former wife who lives at the castle, two years younger than Alexander, of the same age actually as Cleopatra. So what has happened is on the west coast of Turkey, uh, which is in Asia where uh, Philip wants to start conquering Asia, uh, there is a man who's, um, uh, whose favor he wants to win as his connection, so to speak, into Asia, uh, who has a daughter. Uh, and so Philip promises his, quote, half-wit son to marry the daughter. Unfortunately, he does not tell the total truth. He does not tell the story of the boy's uh, mental illness, uh, nor uh, does anyone else get told that the girl is only eight. So you can see the machinations of this King Philip. And so here's a, an episode between Alexander and Aredeos, who is the half-witted stepbrother. Some seven days later, Alexander met Aredeos in the palace courtyard. He came oftener now. The doctors advised he should mix more in company to stir his wits. He trotted eagerly forward to meet Alexander. The old servant, now half a head shorter, bustling anxiously behind. Alexander, who bore him no more malice than an enemy's horse or dog, returned his greeting. How's Prine? he asked. The doll was missing. Have they taken her away? Ariados grinned. There was a wet trickle in his soft black beard. Old Pyrenees in the box. I don't need her. They're bringing me a real girl from Caria, he added, like a dull child echoing adults in obscene boast. Alexander looked at him with pity. Take care of Pyrene. She's a good friend. You might want her after all. Not when I have a wife, he nodded down in Alexander and added with friendly confidence. When you're dead, I shall be king. His keeper tugged quickly at his belt. He went on towards the store, singing to himself a tuneless song. So the fear of losing the throne, obviously, is high now in his mind, uh, which obviously sets other bits of action into place. Uh, and we continue on here as to what happens as the result of that. The room was filled with the king's presence. His big mouth was set in his broad face. His thick brows, which had always an outward tilt, flared up from his frown like a hawk spread wings. Force came from every direction. Alexander planted his feet and waited. He felt the dagger with the nerves under his skin. I knew, said his father, that you were as headstrong as a wild pig and as vain as a Corinth whore. 
treacherous I knew you could be as long as you listened to your mother. But one thing I didn't reckon on, that you were a fool. I left a key thing out. To foil the king, Philip offers himself as the bridegroom to the eight-year-old girl in Turkey. And of course, her father would certainly take Alexander over when he finds out about the half-wit son. At treacherous, Alexander had caught his breath. He began to speak. Be quiet, said the king. How dare you open your mouth? How dare you meddle in my business with your insolence and your ignorant childish spite and blundering brain-sick fool? It was to hear said this, said Alexander into the pause, that you brought Philotus with you. A jar had gone through him like a wound one does not yet feel. No, said the king menacingly, you can wait for that. You have lost me, Caria. Can't you see it, you fool? Before God, since you think so much of yourself, you might have thought better this time. Do you want to be a Persian hanger-on? Do you want to pick up a horde of barbarian marriage kin? You'll hang about you when war begins, selling the enemy our plans and bargaining for your head. Well, if so, your luck's out, for I'll see you to Hades first. You'd be less hindrance there. And after this, do you think Pixadoros will accept Ariadios? Not unless he's a greater fool than you, and small chance of that. I thought I could spare Aredos better. Well, I was a fool. I desert to beget, no, to beget fools. He drew a heavy breath. I have no luck with my first sons. Alexander stood quiet. Even the dagger on his ribs hardly moved against them. Presently, he said, if I am your son, then you have wronged my mother. He spoke without much expression. He was taken up with inward things. Philip's lower lip thrust out. Don't tempt me, he said. I brought her back for your sake. She's your mother. I'm trying to remember it. Don't tempt me before a witness. In the background, Philotus shifted his tall bulk and gave a quiet, sympathetic cough. And now, said Philip, attend to me. I am coming to business. First, I am sending an envoy boy to carry her. He can carry a formal letter from me, refusing my consent to your betrothal, and one from you withdrawing. Or, if you won't write, he can carry one from me, telling Pixadoros he is welcome to you, but he'll be getting no son of mine. If that's your choice, tell me now. No? Very well, then. Second, I don't ask you to control your mother. You couldn't do it. I don't ask you to bring your intrigues to me. I've never asked it. I don't ask now. But while you are here in Macedon as my heir, which is while I choose and no longer, you will keep your hands out of your plots. If you meddle in them again, you can go back where you have been and stay there. Things are not going well for that relationship. The next thing that happens, uh, which continues our saga here, and uh, I'm just going to tell you what happened rather than read it, is younger Cleopatra then, two years younger than Alexander, uh, is now used as a pawn uh, to marry an older widower in a part west of Macedon that uh, Philip wants to add to his conquering area. Uh, and so uh, there's a beautiful scene between brother and sister about that, uh, that she's just being sent off and she wants to know what her brother knows about this man. Fortunately, he is a good man, so this helps. Let's move on to Apollo, and then we'll move on to the very final scene of the book. Of course, whenever something major is to be considered, uh, Apollo, would be um, his word, the God's word would be checked. And so the question that has been sent to Apollo is about the war and the conquering moving across the sea to Asia and starting his great conquering of Asia. This is Philip. Um, so a quick scene here about what Apollo has said. In the Perseus room, the chief diviners, the priests of Apollo and of Zeus, Antipatros and everyone whom rank or office entitled to be there had assembled to hear the oracle delivered. 
The heralds from Delphi stood before the dais. Alexander, who had run the first part of the way, made a slow entrance and stood at the right of the throne, arriving just before the king. Nowadays, he had to manage such things for himself. There was a pause of whispering expectation. This was a royal embassy, not for the swarming petitioners about marriages and land purchases and sea journeys and offspring, who could be dealt with by drawing lots. But for this single question, the gray-haired Pythia had gone into the smoky cave below the temple, mounted the tripod beside the navel stone swathed in its magic nets, chewed her bitter laurel, breathed the vapor from the rock cleft, and uttered her God-crazed mutterings before the shrewd-eyed priest who would interpret them in verse. Old fateful legends drifted like mist from mind to mind. Those of more stolid temper awaited some stock response, advice to sacrifice to the proper gods or to dedicate a shrine. The king limped in and was saluted and sat down. His stiff leg pushed forward. Now he could exercise less. He had begun to put on weight. There was new solid flesh on his square frame, and Alexander, standing behind, saw that his neck had thickened. There were the ritual exchanges. The chief herald unrolled his scroll. Reading, Pythian Apollo to Philip, son of Amantus, king of the Macedonians, answers thus. Wreathed is the bull for the altar, the end fulfilled, and the slayer too is ready. The company pronounced the well-omened phrases prescribed for such occasions. Philip nodded to Antipatros, who nodded back with relief. Pomenion and Atalos were having trouble on the coast of Asia, but now the main force would set out with good augury. There was a satisfied hum. A favorable answer had been expected. The god had much to thank King Philip for, but it was only to greatly honored ones, the courtiers murmured, that two-tongued Apollo spoke with so clear a voice. Wreathed is the bull for the altar, the end justified, and the slayer too is ready. To them that meant good augury. We now go to the final scene that we're going to read today, and that is the wedding of Cleopatra, his daughter, who is 18 at this point now, uh, and uh, our man Alexander is 20. There's tremendous pomp and circumstance because it is connected to the Olympics. And um, there are 12 Olympians who are also to be honored this day. Imagine one of the great theaters of Dionysus or Ephesus or any photos you've ever seen or places you've been, uh, and a huge fanfare. Uh, the place filled with everyone in town, three to 4,000 people, a huge parade in which uh, 12, there are uh, floats, huge floats to 12 of the gods from Hera to Zeus to Dionysus to Artemis, um, followed by the 12 Olympians who are also on the stage. And of course, King Philip being as, uh, well, shall we say self-centered as he is, is wanting to be the very last to enter pomp and circumstance. Normally that would not be the case, which is raising some eyebrows. And so let's see what happens at that final moment. Outside in the road, the king made a sign. Pausanias, you remember him as one of the minor characters, the former lover. Pausanias barked an order. The van of the royal guard weared smartly left and right and fell back on the rear guard behind the king. The theater was some hundred yards away. The chiefs, looking back, saw the guard retire. The king, it seemed, had entrusted himself to them for this last lap of his progress. 
pleased by the compliment, they opened their ranks for him. Noticed only by his own men who thought it none of their business, Pausanias strode on toward the paradox or gate to the theater. Philip saw the sheep's waiting. He walked his horse up to them from the standing ranks of the guard and leaned down smiling. Go on in my friends, I shall come after. They kept moving, but one elderly laird stood planted by his bridle and said with Macedonian forthrightness, no guard king in all this crowd. Philip leaned down and clapped his shoulder. He had been hoping someone would say it. My people are God enough. Let all these foreigners see it. Thanks for your kindness, Arius, but go on in. As the chiefs went forward, he slowed his horse, falling back between the bridegroom and Alexander. From the crowd, each side came a buzz of friendly voices. Ahead was the theater packed with friends. His broad mouth smiled. He had looked forward to this moment of public proof. An elected king whom these southerners had dared call tyrant, let them see for themselves if he needed the tyrant square of spearmen. Let them tell Demosthenes, he thought. He reined up and beckoned. Two servants came up to the younger men and stood ready to hold their horses. You now, my sons. Alexander, who had been watching the chiefs go in, looked sharply round. Are we not to go with you? No, Philip said crisply. Weren't you told? I go in alone. The bridegroom looked away to hide his embarrassment. Were they going to bicker over precedence now before everyone? The last of the chiefs was going through out of sight. He could not walk over by himself. Sitting upright on ox heads, scarlet saddle cloth, Alexander looked along the stretch of empty road, empty in sunlight, wide, trampled, wheel rutted, hoof marked, ringing with emptiness. At its end in the triangle of deep shadow thrown by the parados was a gleam of armor, a line of red cloak. If Pausanias was there, he must have his orders. Oxed pricked up his ears. His eye, bright as onyx, looked sideways. Alexander touched his neck with a finger. He stood like bronze. The bridegroom fidgeted. Why would the youth not move? There were times when one could understand the rumors. It was something about the eyes. There had been a day at Dodona, a bit of wind, a fall of ice and snow lying. He wore a sheepskin cloak. Go down then, said Philip impatiently. Your brother-in-law is waiting. Alexander glanced again at the dark gateway. He pressed with his knee, bringing Oxhead nearer and looked with deep concentration into Philip, his father's face. It is too far, he said quietly. It is better if I go with you. Philip raised his brows under his gold garland. It was clear enough now that the lad, what the lad was after. Well, he had not earned it yet. Let him not push for it. That is my business. I will be judge of what is best. The deep shadow's eyes reached for his. He felt invaded from any subject. It was an affront to stare at the king. It is too far, said the high, clear voice, inexpressive, steady. Let me go on in with you and I will pledge my life for yours. I swear it to you by Heracles. Faint, curious murmurs began to be heard among the bystanders, aware of something up, up, unplanned. Philip, though growing angry, was careful of his face. Keeping down his voice, he said sharply, that is enough. We are not going to the theater to act in tragedy. When I need you, I will tell you so. Obey my orders. Alexander's eyes ceased their quest. His presence left them. They were as empty as clear gray glass. Very well, sir, he said. He dismounted. Alexandros, the bridegroom, followed with relief. Pausanias and the tall gateway saluted as they came. Alexander returned it in passing while he spoke to Alexandros. They ascended their short ramp to the stage, acknowledged the acclamations, and took their seats. 
Outside, Philip touched his rein. With a stately gait, his well-trained charger went forward, undisturbed by noise. The people knew what the king was doing, admired it, and took care he heard. His anger passed. He had something better to think of. If the boy had chosen some more fitting time, he rode on, acknowledging the cheers. He would sooner have walked, but his limp robbed it of dignity. Already through the 20 foot high Parados gate, he would glimpse the orchestra with its ring of gods. The music had sprung up for him. From the stone gateway, a soldier stepped forward to help him down and take his horse. It was Pausanias. In honor of the day, he must have posted himself to this page's service. How long ago? Oh, it was a signal of reconcilement. At last he was ready to forget. A charming gesture. In the old days, he had had a gift for such acts of grace. Philip slid stiffly down, smiled, and began to speak. Pausanias's left hand took his arm in a tightening grip. Their looks bent. Pausanias brought out his right hand from his cloak so swiftly that Philip never saw the dagger, except in Pausanias's eyes. The god up the road saw the king fall and Pausanias stoop over him. His lame foot must have stumbled, the men thought, and Pausanias been clumsy. Suddenly Pausanias straightened up and began to run. He had been eight years in the garden for five of them commanded it. A farmer among the crowd was the first to call out. He's killed the king. As if given leave to credit their senses, with confused shouts, the soldiers rushed toward the theater. An officer reached the body, stared at it, pointed wildly, and yelled after him. A stream of men poured round the corner behind the backstage buildings. The king's well-trained charger stood stolidly by the parados. No one had thought fast enough to dare the outrage of mounting it. A piece of land behind the theater, sacred to Dionysus, its guardian god, had been farmed by the priests with, bane, with vines. The thick, black, old stalks were dappled in young shoots and bright green leaves. On the earth glinted Pausanias's helmet, flung away as he ran, his red cloak draped a vine prop. He raced over the rough clods toward the old stone wall and its open gateway. Beyond it, a mountain man with a spare horse was waiting. Pausanias was in hard training and not yet, not yet 30, but in the hunt were youths, not yet 20, who had learned mountain warfare with Alexander. They had trained still harder. Three or four drew out in front. The gap began to narrow. It was narrowing too slowly, however. The gate was not far ahead. The man with the horses had turned their heads ready towards the open road. Suddenly, as if an invisible spear had struck him, Pausanias hurtled forward. An arched, knotted root had caught his toe. He fell flat, then rose on hands and knees, tugging free his booted foot. But the young men were on him. He twisted over, looking from one to another, searching. No luck, but he had faced this chance from the first. He had cleansed his honor. He dragged at his sword. Someone set a foot on his arm, another trod on his corselet. He had had no time to feel the pride of it. He thought, as all the iron hacked down, no time. The man with the horses, after one glance, had unhitched the spare one, lashed his own mount, and raced away. But the stunned pause was over. Hoofs drummed on the road beyond the vines. The riders spurred after him through the gates, knowing the value of the prize. In the vineyard, the press had caught up with the leading hunters. An officer looked down at the body, bleeding like some ancient sacrifice into the roots of the vine stalk. You finished him, you young fools. Now he can't be questioned. I never thought of it, said Leonatus, the drunkenness of the blood chase leaving him. I was afraid he'd still get away. I only thought, said Perticus, of what he'd done. He wiped his sword on the dead man's kilt. As they walked away, Aratus said to the others, well, it's best. You know the story. If he talked, it could only disgrace the king. 
What king, said Leonatos, the king is dead. And the new king, our man, Alexander the Great, at age 20, rises to the throne and goes down this history as one of the great leaders of the ancient world. Sorry to go a bit over time. I hope you found it interesting enough to stick with me. I think it's a brilliant book, Fire from Heaven by Mary Renault. I won't go any further there because I want to tell you a tad bit about next week's book. We're going to make a quite an about face. I suppose an about face would be a fantasy space age book. Uh, not that, not that. <laughs> uh, we are going to go to one of my favorite writers. Um, I have so many, but this is certainly one of them. And uh, you know this man from the great book he wrote, The Great Gatsby. And of course, I'm speaking of F. Scott Fitzgerald. But we're not going to read The Great Gatsby. We're going to read another favorite of mine that is very close to being the greatest book he ever wrote, although he didn't know that when he died, um, unfortunately. Uh, Tender is the Night is the book. And just a tad bit here from the cover, F. Scott Fitzgerald wrote in a friend's copy of Tender is the Night. If you like the great Gatsby, for God's sakes, read this. Gatsby was a tour de force, but this is a confession of faith. Set in the south of France in the decade after World War I, Tender is the Night is a story of a brilliant and magnetic psychiatrist named Dick Diver the bewitching, wealthy, and dangerous, unstable mental patient, Nicole, who becomes his wife, and the beautiful, narrowing, harrowing, 10-year pas de deux they act out along the border between sanity and madness. So off to the Riviera we go, mostly to the village of Antibes, one of my favorite spots in the South France. It's also the spot where Napoleon landed when he came back to France. Anyway, I hope you'll be with me next week for a very different book. I try to mix them up as much as possible. And I think you might enjoy this if you like The Great Gatsby and if you like the period. Of course, we're talking about the 20s and up into the 30s. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please, please do like it and consider sharing it with your friends. Also, please feel free to leave a comment or perhaps the suggestion of a book. We're always looking for new interesting suggestions from our viewers. I also encourage you to sus subscribe to the Camden Public Library Programs YouTube channel to stay on top of all of the great programs and the great content of the library. Thanks again for being here back in ancient Greece back in 323 BC. I hope you have a good week and we'll see you next week. Goodbye.